In this lesson, we're beginning our discussion of the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. So really, the goal of this lesson is just to overview the big picture analytical framework. We don't want to really worry about, in this introductory lesson, trying to perfect our understanding of the equal protection analysis. As we work through our series of videos in equal protection, we're gonna break all of these steps and all of these concepts down in far greater detail. So really the only goal here is just to try to get that big picture understanding of the analytical framework. Okay, but to begin our discussion of the Equal Protection Clause, the best place to start is with the U.S. Constitution itself. We go to the 14th Amendment and we look at the Equal Protection Clause. It tells us that no state shall make or enforce any law which shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. This is the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. Probably the first note to make is if we look at the Equal Protection Clause, it tells us no state shall make or enforce any law. The deal here is when we read this word state, we understand pursuant to Balling v. Sharp, the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause applies to the federal government through the 5th Amendment Due Process Clause. So even though the 14th Amendment says no state shall make or enforce any law which shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws, we understand that this really applies to states and federal government as well. It also applies to local government too. So no local government, state government, or federal government shall make or enforce any law which shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. The Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment applies to local government, state government, and federal government, okay? And we covered this in our video on the state action requirement, but just as a quick refresher. But the main concept we wanna focus on here Right, what does this mean, the equal protection of the laws? When the 14th Amendment guarantees a person equal protection of the laws, what does that really mean? Well, obviously, that's a complex question, and we're going to spend an entire series of videos trying to explain and understand what this concept of equal protection of the laws actually means, how we apply this in a constitutional law analysis. But probably the best place to start when we're trying to understand what equal protection of the laws actually means is with understanding what it does not mean. If we think about equal protection of the laws, we understand that this could not possibly be construed in a civilized society to mean that all people in all situations are going to be treated 100% equally in the same in all contexts, right? That would be virtually impossible and nonsensical, right? Especially when people are not similarly situated. And that's kind of the theme we're going to see. Think about, for a very basic example, think about any minimum age requirement law in the United States. Take alcohol consumption, right? In the United States, you have to be 21 years of age to consume alcohol. This is a law that's passed by the government. You have to be 21 years of age to consume alcohol. Well, if we think about that law, that law is not providing equal protection. It's not treating every single person the exact same, right? Six-year-olds are not allowed to drink alcohol. 21-year-olds are allowed to drink alcohol. So that law is not treating six-year-olds equally to 21-year-olds. But of course, we know minimum drinking age laws are constitutional. Every state has a minimum drinking age law. It's well established that that is constitutional. So what's going on there? Well, the deal is a six-year-old is not similarly situated to a 21-year-old, right? We can understand why it's probably a bad idea to let six-year-olds drink alcohol and why, you know, it's not as bad, at least, to let 21-year-olds drink alcohol. Just based on the physiological differences between the body of a six-year-old and a 21-year-old, 
you know, the behavior differences of a six-year-old and a 21-year-old, the fact that six-year-olds are generally not operating, you know, motor vehicles, all of this stuff, right? There's a ton of reasons we could say it makes sense, right, basically to treat a six-year-old differently than a 21-year-old. Think about the right to vote, the right to, you know, not the right to gamble, but think about gambling, consuming alcohol, consuming tobacco, voting, right? The government requires enlisting in the military. The government requires for all of these things that a person be a certain age. And in all of those cases, the government is treating the child very differently than the adult. And that's because the child is not in the same circumstance as the adult. So it seems, it seems to be more justifiable, right? The government has far more justification to say, look, a six-year-old cannot drink alcohol and a 21-year-old can drink alcohol. Think about something else, not just age requirement laws. Think about you know, government benefits. The government treats billionaires and millionaires very differently than people who live below the poverty line. Right? And again, this is something that's going to be seen by almost everyone, hopefully, as justifiable okay, for the government to do. We can understand why it makes sense for a person living below the poverty line to be entitled to government benefits, whereas a person who's a millionaire, a billionaire, is not entitled to the same benefits because, again, the person living below the poverty line is not similarly situated to the millionaire or to the billionaire. Okay. So that's kind of the theme we need to remember with the Equal Protection Clause, okay? When we say a person is guaranteed equal protection of the law, what is really meant here is people who are similarly situated, who are in the same circumstances, are guaranteed equal protection of the laws. Okay, and that's kind of the theme you'll see the Supreme Court grappling with as we go through this analysis. Because obviously, if we change those facts a little bit, we can see, imagine that we have a clone of me, right? Imagine standing right next to me, we have a clone who is identical to me in every single way. He's got the same job, the same age, the same socioeconomic status, me and this clone sitting next to me are the exact same person in every way. Except, let's say that my clone is from another country. Let's say my clone is from Europe, okay? My clone came from, doesn't matter, Italy, okay? So my clone came from Italy and became a citizen in the United States. And me, I was born and raised in the United States all of my ancestors that I am aware of are from the United States. So I am just American. I would just say that I'm American as my nationality. I would say I'm from the United States, I'm American. But my clone might say, hey, look, I'm Italian American. I immigrated from Italy and I became a citizen here. So I'm Italian American. But in every other way, my clone and I are the exact same person. Would the government be justified in treating me and my clone from Italy differently, right? Or should we get equal protection of the law? Would it make sense for the government to say, okay, well, the guy from America, that version of you can drink alcohol. The one who's 20 or the one who's from Italy cannot drink alcohol. Can the government justify that? Well, that becomes way, way more difficult, right? That's less, that doesn't make as much sense. When we think about the difference between, you know, the 21 year old and the six year old, we can see how the government is justified in saying, look, the six year old can't drink alcohol, the 21 year old can't. They're not similarly situated. But if we look at me and an Italian version of me, an Italian American version of me, we can see those two are similarly situated. They're in the same circumstance. You know, you're not going to be able to justify if you're the government treating that Italian American differently or unequally than the American because they're so similarly situated. Okay, and that's where you would probably get into violations of the Equal Protection Clause. Okay, so really this whole analysis comes down to, you know, 
And what the Supreme Court grapples with, what this theme is that we see is, you know, what does it mean to be similarly situated? And that's how we kind of end up with these classes and categorizations of classes and kind of this step-by-step -step analysis. But that's the big picture idea. The main thing to recognize as we begin to get into this analysis is the Equal Protection Clause does not guarantee that every single person is going to be treated the exact same in all situations, right? It could be because two people are in radically different circumstances, the government is justified in treating them differently, such as a six-year-old versus a 21-year-old. But in other situations, two people are so similarly just so similarly situated, the government is not justified in treating them unequally. Okay, that's our big picture idea. With that, we can just get into our steps of the analysis. What do we do if we encounter what we think might be an equal protection issue on a constitutional law fact pattern? Well, step one is issue spotting, right? Step one, we need to determine whether the Equal Protection Clause is at issue. How do we do this? The Equal Protection Clause is generally at issue when the government treats a person differently based on that person's membership in some classification of people. Basically, when we have governmental discrimination on the basis of class membership. This is our issue spotter. Very important to recognize. This does not mean if we see the government is treating one class of people differently than another class of people, that does not mean the Equal Protection Clause has been violated. It just means, hey, the Equal Protection Clause might be at issue here. We can at least go to step number two. Okay, so that's what we're looking for here with step number one. The government is treating two groups of people differently based on membership in some class. That's what lets us know okay, equal protection is at issue. And what I'll do here is we can quickly go through each of these steps, step one, two, three, four, and five, and then I'll just go through some examples because the best way to illustrate this is with examples. Okay, so that's kind of step one, that's issue spotting. Step two, we determine whether the state action requirement is satisfied. We covered the state action requirement in a ton of detail in a prior video, so I'm not gonna rehash it here. But remember, we need to make sure that the challenged action is attributable to the government. It can be local government, state government, or federal government, but we have to make sure that the action being challenged under the Equal Protection Clause is attributable to the government. That is step two. The Equal Protection Clause does not apply to private parties. Step number three, after we go past step one, step two, we get to step three, we need to categorize the government's classification as suspect, quasi-suspect, or other. This is relatively straightforward, right? We have three major suspect classifications. That's going to be race, national origin, and alienage. We have two major quasi-suspect classifications. That's sex and legitimacy. It's possible we could have additional suspect classes, quasi-suspect classes, but for our purposes, these are the big five we wanna focus on. Race, national origin, and alienage are suspect classes. So if we see the government discriminating on the basis of race, national origin, or alienage, we're going to categorize that classification as suspect. If we see the government discriminating on the base of sex or legitimacy, we're going to categorize that classification as quasi-suspect. And when I use the word discrimination in our equal protection context, I really just mean we're treating two groups differently, okay? It's possible that the government might be favoring, you know, one race over another race, and that race they're favoring is a race that's been historically discriminated against. This might be, you know, kind of like affirmative action. We're still going to call that discriminatory, even though it might be like good faith discrimination for our purposes and equal protection, and really that's kind of benign discrimination versus invidious discrimination. That's what the court is going to call it or what you're going to see this referred to as. Benign discrimination is kind of like good faith discrimination where you see the government trying to favor a 
protected class generally is a means of redressing the effects of past discrimination. And then you have stuff like invidious discrimination where the government is burdening a protected class in some way. But in either case, right, really when we use the word discrimination, my point here is we really just mean that the government is treating two groups differently, okay? We're not using discrimination necessarily in the same way that layman people use it. When you hear a layman person talk about discrimination, they usually mean it in the bad faith sense, you know, the, 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 the bad faith context of discrimination. When we use it in equal protection, we just mean two people are being treated differently. It's not necessarily good or bad. We have to go through the analysis to kind of make the determination as to what's going on. But that's what we mean by discrimination. So. Step number three, we categorize the government's classification as suspect, quasi-suspect, or other. Remember, discrimination or treating people differently based on race, national origin, or alienage, we call suspect. Treating people differently or discriminating on the basis of sex or legitimacy, we categorize that as quasi-suspect. Anything else, like age, wealth, you know, socioeconomic status, anything that's not race, national origin, alienage, sex, legitimacy, we categorize as other. So if the government is discriminating on the basis of age, wealth, socioeconomic status, we categorize that in step three as other. Okay, step number four. If the government's classification from step number three is suspect or quasi-suspect, we need to determine whether the plaintiff has established that the government acted with the intent to discriminate on the basis of the protected class. This is really important as a gateway issue before we get to step five, because we understand or we need to recognize with step four, the court will not apply a heightened level of scrutiny unless the plaintiff first establishes that the government acted with the intent to discriminate on the basis of the protected class. So we're gonna have a whole video breakdown on the governmental intent to discriminate requirement. But the main idea here is, in order for the court to apply a heightened level of scrutiny, the court is going to want to see that the discrimination is basically intentional or purposeful, right? The government had the intent to discriminate. It's generally not enough that the government has passed a law that has some disproportionate impact on one group. You know, if the government passes a law without any intent to discriminate, and it just so happens one class of people is disproportionately impacted in a negative way by that law, that's generally not going to be enough for the court to apply a heightened level of scrutiny. The court wants to see an actual intent to discriminate on the part of the government to apply these heightened levels of scrutiny. Again, we're gonna break that concept down in a ton of detail in a future lesson. After we go through step one, two, three, and four, we're ready in step number five, our final step, to apply the applicable judicial standard of review. So we'll go through these steps, and these steps will tell us what standard of review we're applying. We have rational basis as our default standard, and we have heightened levels of scrutiny with intermediate and strict scrutiny. And we only apply the heightened levels of scrutiny when the government's classification is suspect or quasi-suspect and the requisite intent requirement from step number four is satisfied. Of course, we know if we're applying rational basis, in most cases, the government will prevail and the law will be upheld as constitutional. If we're applying strict scrutiny, we know in most cases the government will not prevail and the law will be struck down in violation of the Equal Protection Clause. And we know if we're applying intermediate scrutiny, it's kind of in the middle, it can go either way. And remember, we covered the application of these judicial standards of review in a ton of detail in a prior lesson. So if you need a refresher on the judicial standards of review, I would go back and watch that lesson. Also, as we work through our series in equal protection, we're going to kind of break down how these standards of review are applied in the equal protection context in more detail in future videos. So don't worry about you know, perfecting your understanding of the application of judicial standards of review here. 
We're going to cover that in future lessons and we did a big overview video on it on a previous lesson. Okay, but that's your big picture five steps. So what we can do is go through some examples and apply these steps so we can kind of see big picture how this plays out. So the way I would do this is by looking at three laws and we can apply these five steps to those three laws and see the different outcomes. And this is going to illustrate our analytical framework. Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program, or LEAP for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap. Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata videos. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Studicata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else. Um, in any of the other online resources that i found. So I would certainly recommend Sudicata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're going to do great. I would definitely uh, recommend Sudicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it, uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Studicata video lectures throughout my law school career. And I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.